We're going to continue to look at the story of Nehemiah and his exploits and challenges. Thank you, uh, Sarah. As he sees the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt and the city come back to life after decades of being largely abandoned and in ruin and a, a state of dilapidation. And I have to admit, as I've been preparing this week, God has been testing me on this word time after time, even this morning. And uh, I might uh, share one or two things, but uh, because um, what we're going to look at is focusing, the need of focusing and not being distracted. And boy, have I had distractions this week that have tried to sort of pull me away. And uh, uh, so this is a very relevant uh, word for me. And I trust because I trust you're not too different from me, really, uh, that actually is a relevant word for you uh, as well. So we're going to look uh, today at the importance of focus and not getting distracted. I've called this talk Focus to Finish, and, uh, because focus matters. Uh, one writer has pointed out that you can have all the abilities and opportunities in the world, but if you don't have some focus... You'll never get anywhere, not in your life and not in your service of God either. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Now, um, uh, my wife Sue, as you will know, she loves her music. She loves to practice. She loves to practice the piano and the double bass. And she's often in the, in the dining room where her instruments are. And when she gets practicing, she is really focused. She does not hear anything else. She won't hear the telephone. She won't hear the doorbell. And if I'm in a mischievous mood, I can come into the room and say, Hi, Sue. And she go, ah! <laughs> because, she's so, because she's so focused on, on the music. And um, I think our son, Philip, this is not a picture of Philip. This is just for the internet. I think he's picked up some of his, his mum's um, ability to focus because I remember very clearly when he was about four or five years old, we gave him his first bike and he was so determined to learn to ride that bike on his own he didn't want any help oh no <laughs> and he wouldn't have any stabilizer wheels and he took it out and we had a path that went round a piece of ground piece of earth and he got on that bike and he was kind of walking and one foot and two foot and falling off and picking up and he just kept going for about an hour until he could ride his bike and he was absolutely <laughs> determined that's what he was like. He's still a bit like that. Uh, now, he's focused and he got what he, he wanted. Now, we're all different in, in many different ways, but that doesn't mean that focus is not important for everyone. Important to us as believers that we focus on Jesus. That's what will enable us to be effective in seeing the kingdom of God come more and more in our own lives and in the lives of our community, that we focus on Jesus. The Apostle Paul had this sort of focus, which he showed when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, where he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. He knew he was coming to the end of his life, probably by execution, in fact. Um, but he knew that, and he, he, fit, he knew that he, would, he had fought the good fight, he'd finished the race, kept the faith. Later he was to write to his young, younger, up-and-coming church leader, Timothy himself. He said to Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. You see, he's saying to Timothy, be like a soldier. Don't get entangled with all that stuff, with all that stuff that distracts you. But keep focus. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember the gospel. That's where our focus is. That could have been written about Nehemiah, in fact. Because Nehemiah, too, was focused on what God had given him to do. And uh, we've come to the place in the story of Nehemiah, we're going to look at chapter 6 in a minute, where the walls are almost finished, but there's still battles to fight. And it's like, in fact, it's like the enemy is turning up the heat somewhat. And also, you can see that God is teaching them through this adversity that they face to keep focused, to keep focused on what God had given them to do. 
So where are we in the story? Let me just recap very briefly. We've seen how Nehemiah, um, he'd been in exile in Babylon, and he'd been stirred by hearing how the city of God and Jerusalem were still in ruins with broken down walls, and his heart was moved. And uh, with all the provision of God in the resources and the money and the soldiers and the king's decree that had miraculously come to him, he went from Babylon, where he was comfortable, a rich, wealthy city, to the ruins of Jerusalem. He was a man of vision. He caught a vision. A man of prayer. A man who faced opposition, but was learning to keep godly perspective on things. He had a vision. And as Phil Moore puts it, his vision was of a renewed city teeming with God-glorifying life, laughter and worship. I love that summary that Phil Moore has written there. A city, a renewed city teeming with God-glorifying life, laughter and worship. And we'll see as we go through this how that's a foretaste of the New Testament picture of the church. That's what the church should be like. And then, ultimately, of the new Jerusalem that is going to come down from heaven at the end of all things, the dwelling place of God and all his people. The church is a forerunner of that, a foretaste of that. God with his people. So as a way of reminding ourselves of some key points, I've just picked out some uh, important stirring verses that we've come across in the first few chapters of Nehemiah, which I'll just put up here um, and read them to you. These are ones we've come across already. This is Nehemiah speaking. He said, the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. God had done something in his heart and revealed something. And then in chapter 2, a bit later, it says, But now I said to them, You know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. There's the call to work for the kingdom of God. A bit later in the chapter, then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me. That was his testimony. And then he says, I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. God's going to help them. In chapter 4, he says, don't be afraid of the enemy. <clears throat> Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. That could be a sort of Churchillian speech, couldn't it? <laughs> and then in 420, when you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. And Vicky reminded us of how the trumpets were made from the ram's horns, so a sheep, a, a ram, was sacrificed for that trumpet. And it reminds us that actually the call to us is to hear the gospel and rush to it. Rush to the gospel when you hear the word of Jesus Christ. And in 5, last week, which Mark read to us, But because I feared God, I did not act that way. I also devoted myself to working on the wall. Stirring verses, aren't they? Aren't they? And now we come to chapter 6. So I'm going to read this. I've put up some of the main uh, parts of chapter 6 up on the screen. But I'll read. it's a good story. So listen to the story. Everyone likes a story, don't they? So uh, let's listen to this story. Three characters it starts with. Let me take a sip. <clears throat> Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained, though we had not yet set up the doors in the gates. So Sambalat and Geshem sent a message, asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. <coughs> but I realised they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them, I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave the same reply. The fifth time, Sambalat's servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There is a rumour among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it's true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, your plan, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. 
you can be very sure that this report will get back to the King, so I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued the work with even greater determination. Later, I went to visit Shemaiah, son of Deliah, and grandson of Mechatabal, who was confined to his home. And he said, let us meet together in the temple of God and bolt the doors and shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I realised that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tambiah and Sambalat had hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. Then they will be able to accuse and discredit me. Remember, O oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sambalat have done. And remember Noadiah the prophet and all the prophets like her who have tried to intimidate me. So, on October the 2nd, 445 BC, the wall was finished, just 52 days after we had begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realised this work had been done with the help of our God. Wow, what a testimony. <laughs> so, there's some attack here, isn't there? There's some spiritual attack. And it starts really with the unholy trinity of Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem, who we keep meeting, these three cronies and their friends. Uh, they're out to intimidate and distract Nehemiah from the work of the kingdom of God in rebuilding. Um, it's a bit more subtle this time, rather than a direct attack. This time they're suggesting a meeting on the plain of Ono. We can have a great play on, of words on this one, Ono, oh can't we? Oh no, oh no that's right. <laughs> Nehemiah replies, oh no, <laughs> you don't. I can't go down there. I'm about a great work up here. I'm not leaving here for you, Nehemiah says. He says, oh no, to the plain of Ono. <laughs> It's very, it'll help us to remember it at least. What this attack and distraction is really about is this. What do we really value in life? The way to be focused is to know and value the right thing. Do we value the plain of Ono down there? Or do we value Mount Zion, the city of God, the kingdom of God up here and all that that stands for? The plain of Ono was actually geographically lower than Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was up on a mountain. And it's a reminder that when our focus <coughs> shifts from things that are not God's will, it's always a step down. It's always a step down. Things may be tempting, things may be appealing, but compared to God's ways, it's always a step down to Ono. <laughs> what we value in life is a key question and will determine where our focus is. Is it on God and his kingdom, or is it down on the plain of Ono? This could be, could be about all sorts of things. It could be about relationships. Is this relationship which I'm interested in, is it a come up here with God, or a come down to Ono type of relationship? Is this relationship leading, to you, leading you to a better relationship with Jesus, or away from him? That's a good question to ask about, about any particularly new relationship you might be pursuing. What about a new job opportunity or a new promotion? What does God get out of it in terms of helping you to live a God-honouring life? Anything or nothing? The same could be said about acquiring something new. It looks good, but does it help me or hinder me from focusing on God? And all sorts of other decisions about what we value in life, where we spend our money, how much we give, how, much, how, how we spend our time, all these things reflect what we really value in life. I'll tell you a story. Um, quite a few years ago now, um, Sue and I, we were buying our first, what I would call, really decent car. We'd had a lot of cars, but most of them were fairly old and 
very second-hand, if you know what I mean. Um, but finally, we, we, we were able to buy what I considered a decent car, a nice-looking car. It was, wasn't new, but it was fairly new. It had quite a lot of gadgets on. It went well. I was really pleased with it. But I knew when I bought it, I thought, God's speaking to me about how tightly I'm going to hold on to this car in my heart. I knew that. I knew it could be an issue between me and God. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> um, about a week after we got the car, um, Sue had a call from uh, our daughter, uh, who was about to give birth. Um, would you be able to come up and be with me? So Sue said, oh, you know, I can I take the car up to Leeds um, to be with Anna, because, um, uh, you know, for a while. So I said, fine, I think it would be a week or so. And I was left with the, the other car that we had, which was an old banger. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, and Sue went up there, and then Anna was really delayed in having the baby. So it ended up Sue was there for about six weeks. I thought, I was feeling, oh, this is a bit rotten. I can't even drive my nice new car. <laughs> I've just got this old car left. <laughs> and I knew what God was saying to me, hold it lightly, <laughs> hold it lightly. And uh, Sue came back, and then about a month later, I was now driving the car, I smelt a sort of oily smell, and we were going to go on holiday with the car, so I thought, I better get it checked out. And it ended up, it needed a thousand pounds worth of work on the engine, because... <laughs> something major and it just just finished its guarantee as well after buying it so, oh you know but you know god provided as of course he of course he provided but you know, it's a challenge isn't it um because we are engaged in a spiritual warfare we have an enemy that who the the devil who will try to trip us up with all sorts of distractions often very practical things often things that are part of life Often things that are not wrong in themselves, but constantly raising the question of who or what am I valuing the most? That question constantly comes to us. That's a, a first line of attack, it seems. Um, as, as I said, uh, I've had a, a week of a number of distractions. In fact, a couple of weeks of a number of distractions. And uh, even this morning, um, you know, I'll tell you this, you'll be all very sad about this, I know. But um, <laughs> just as I was packing the car with all the church equipment, there was a screech of brakes uh, outside and uh, a car had hit our cat. Um, uh, yeah, I knew, I knew that would get a response. <laughs> really sad, but he, he's all right. Well, we hope he's all right. Um, and uh, he sort of scampered off into the, into the hedge, and we tried to follow him. The, the driver was really apologetic. It wasn't his fault. Um, yeah, the the, the uh, cat uh, scampered off into the hedge. We couldn't find him because you know, he was shocked, and he was obviously going to hide, and we're trusting that he's going to come back, and we'll, we'll deal with that. But I said to Sue, I said, we've just got to not let this get distract us. We're here to worship God, trust, trust God with the cat, but all these things come, don't they? And they're very valid things. And they're, thing that do, they're things that do affect us. And uh, so we just prayed there and then. We prayed for the cat. And uh, we prayed for ourselves. That actually we will continue to be focused on what God had called us to, to do this morning. So these things are very real. However, it goes on. Because the next line of attack is another common one. Character assassination. <laughs> Sambalat writes an unsealed, open letter spreading an untrue rumour about Nehemiah and his plans. In today's terms, it would have been a social media post or a tweet or something. And uh, uh, Nehemiah sees through it. He gives a very blunt reply. He's saying, it's untrue and you're just trying to frighten us. It didn't put Nehemiah off at all. But it's a very real thing. It's a very real thing these days, isn't it? Um, it was an attempt to discredit Nehemiah. And then there's another attempt to discredit him as well, this time from someone within his own community, one of his own prophets, tries to lead him astray by suggesting he hides out in the holy temple, which was against God's law for him to do that. Only the priests were allowed into the temple. Nehemiah was not a priest. He's playing on the fear and he's suggesting an easy way out. A way that would have actually discredited Nehemiah and given him a bad name. These attacks on character, especially when they come from someone within our own community, are some of the hardest to bear, actually. And it can happen in church too. And we should aim always to make sure we don't engage in those open letters of rumour and gossip. 
that dishonor or discredit uh, other believers, one another, or someone we know. Um, or even tries to lead someone into something that is not really right, that's a sin. We need to be mindful of one another, wanting the best for one another. In fact, one of the values of Regions Beyond as a, as a family of churches, and therefore one of our values, is to be there for one another's success. To be there for one another's success. Just the opposite of what Nehemiah was experiencing, even from his own people who were actually out to discredit him or were actively trying to discredit him. It's a very <coughs> real thing. Mark also spoke last week to us about the enemy within, the enemy within of selfishness and self-promotion and ambition, which is another way in which the enemy gets in, takes the focus off of following Jesus. So let's be aiming to speak in an honouring way of one another, remembering the good in each other and with words of grace and yet when necessary forgiveness because people do make mistakes and they do say things that they perhaps shouldn't have said and we need to have a spirit of forgiveness not of judgment and harshness so how do we how do we stand against these sort of attacks the enemy will try to bring distractions to us will try to stir up attacks on our character will try to sow dissension um, and uh, try to work at our standing before one another. How do we withstand these type of attacks? And I know that some of you have faced some attacks this week from people that you work with. I've heard of three people this week who shared uh, in different ways the challenges they faced with people this week who are kind of having a go or just not being very pleasant um, in your work situation. So I know this is relevant. I know this is relevant. How do we, how do we stand? Well... The first thing is we do need to remember we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Our enemy is not other people. I will say that again and again and again. Our enemy is not other people. It's the devil who is stirring up other people. That applies whether it's inside the church or outside the church. Our enemy is not other people. Colossians chapter 2 verses 14 to 15 says... He, that's Jesus, cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus has won the victory for us. So we don't attack one another back. We don't attack people back. But we place our trust and our confidence in Jesus and his victory and resist the attack of the enemy. We place our confidence in Jesus. So how do you get that victory practically? Well, as I've mentioned, the first thing is by putting most value on what God values, by setting our priorities. Oh, yeah. His kingdom and, his, and kingdom living in our families, in our work, in our recreation, his righteousness, his body, the church, his commandments to love one another, his commandments to go into all the world. There's the priorities, the kingdom of God and living in the kingdom of God in family, work, recreation. His righteousness, his body, the church, that's a priority. His commandments to love one another, his commandments to go into all the world. That covers all the main commandments that Jesus told us. These are the valuable things. And, saying, and then saying no to the things down there on the plane of oh no <laughs> saying no to those things valuing the right things and saying no to the wrong things it's what Jesus referred to as seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you that's in Matthew chapter 6 seek first the kingdom of God and then secondly we remember to pray pray for help Nehemiah was so good at this he faced all sorts of things, and, and the stories are just peppered with little verses about, and then I prayed, or, and then we prayed. It's just all over the story. We keep reading how he had those moments when he just stopped and prayed. In chapter 6, verse 9, it says, But I prayed, now strengthen my hands. What a great arrow prayer that is. It wasn't a great long prayer. It was, God, strengthen my hands. <laughs> And notice that at that point, 
he was actually doing okay. He hadn't given in to the attack at this stage. He was resisting quite well, but he still prayed because he knew it didn't depend on his own ability. And then after it was too late to pray, he there and then prayed. So often, we wait until something happens and then pray, don't we? Can we be on the front foot and pray before it happens? <laughs> Strengthen my hands. Strengthen my hands. So I learned this about um, travelling a bit when we were in Tajikistan. The roads were so awful. Um, the transport, well, the cars and taxis and things were liable to break down and there were bandits, there were all sorts of things. And we would always pray immediately we got in the car. God, will you protect us? Travelling mercies, they used to call it, didn't they? Will you give us travelling mercies? Now, you don't do it so much in this country. We don't do it so much either because things are kind of generally okay. You kind of expect... If you're going on a journey, you're going to get from A to B reasonably well. Well, perhaps we should, but we learnt that you had to. And interestingly, um, most of our taxi drivers and our, our uh, drivers, vehicle drivers were Muslims. They would always pray anyway, so we just got in first. So, <laughs> shall I pray? Before they pray to Allah, we pray to Jesus. Let's be on the front foot and pray before things happen. Yeah, we can pray after things happen. Of course we can. Of course we can. But even how much better to pray before things happen. God strengthen our hands. <laughs> then we see that Nehemiah stood his ground because he knew the word of God. He knew that if he had run into that temple to hide, he would have been breaking God's law. It's in Numbers chapter 18, which forbade anyone except priests to go into the sanctuary. If he, did, if he had done so, he would have been punished and discredited. It's an obvious application for us, isn't it? If we don't know our Bible, we'll be in danger of getting distracted and caught out and fall into sin. I remember a phrase I heard as a young Christian, and I wrote, remember writing this in the front of my Bible. I was probably about 17, 18 years old at the time. Sin will keep me from this book, and this book will keep me from sin. It's a very good phrase. Did I write it up there or not? I didn't write it up there. What a pity. I should have written it up. I'll say it again slowly. Sin will keep me from this book, and this book will keep me from sin. Yeah, good one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll try and put it on the WhatsApp group. <laughs> I don't know who said it, but it wasn't me. <laughs> right. The point is, read this book and get it into your system whether you read it on an app or whether you listen to it on an app, however you do it, read this book and get it into your system. Psalm 119, uh, the psalmist wrote this. How, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? And it would apply to older people as well, I assure you. By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11. Value what God values. Pray and get to know God's word. Well, we're coming into land now. And as we conclude, we read these marvellous verses that uh, I read out earlier from chapter 6. See, on October the 2nd, 445 BC, I, wonder, I love the accuracy of the word of God. <laughs> it's recorded the date. The wall was finished. Some of our translations don't do that, but they, they sort of have some sort of Jewish calendar word, and others have worked out that that's the date that it was. Uh, October the 2nd, 445 BC. The wall was finished just 52 days after we'd begun. When our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. They realised this work had been done with the help of God. It says it all, doesn't it? The work was finished. The enemy was defeated and God was given the glory. The city of God was now protected and could grow and flourish with all the temple worship reinstated, the sacrifices for sin starting off again. And it was done with God's strength, God's protection, with God's wisdom, God's help and with God's people. And we mustn't forget that. And with God's people. Vicky spoke so well uh, about God's people all being involved in this work of God a few weeks ago. And uh, in fact, uh, we wrote some things down on post-it notes, do you remember? Although that list of things that we, we think we could possibly do as a church, well, we collated those 
and we're discussing those. And let me just say to you, if you've got something on that list and you want to get it done, well, come and see us or just do it. <laughs> because they're good things. <laughs> just do it. Because actually we're behind you. We're behind one another in proclaiming the gospel and getting involved. So let me encourage you uh, about that. Um, and some of those things on the list were quite personal things where you need to pray. But if you want someone to pray with, well, go and get someone to pray with about that person that you put on the list. If you want to start a walking group or something like that, yeah. well, don't wait for me to say, let's start a walking group. <laughs> let's start, start a walking group. Get some friends together. We'll get behind you. If you need some support or advice, that's fine. Um, but uh, do whatever God has put on your heart, actually, which is another Bible um, uh, verse from another story. Um, but in it all, God was exalted and praised, not the people, not Nehemiah, but God was given the glory. And it reminds us of the church, of the community of believers in Jesus, as I said. We are like a city protected by a wall, and that wall is Jesus' death on a cross, the final sacrifice for us. He conquered and defeated the enemy. He conquered the devil, he conquered sin, and he conquered death. The cross became like a protective barrier between us and the devil, death, and sin. And as Jesus hung on the cross, just about to die, what did he say out loud? It is finished. Just like Nehemiah said, the wall is finished. Jesus said, it is finished. The work of atonement, the work of sacrifice for sins was finished there and then. <laughs> Death was defeated. The wrath of God was appeased. There was no accusation that can stand against us. And Jesus promises to be with us forever. The wall was finished. The work of Jesus is finished. doesn't mean that there weren't further challenges for Nehemiah. There were. There were many further challenges and attacks and battles that he had to deal with. And as we shall see, but as we shall see, the foundational key turning point was the wall was finished. And for us, the foundation is Jesus died on the cross because he loved you. And he has finished his work of atonement and of forgiveness and of appeasing the wrath of God and rising from the dead to conquer death and sin. That protective wall of the city was complete and the death of Jesus on the cross is complete. And it actually happened. Just like we had the date when the wall was finished, we have the date that we remember as Easter Day, but there is a date in history because it was an actual event. It wasn't a story. It was an actual event. Jesus hung on the cross. He was put in the grave. And on the third day, he actually rose bodily from the dead. It's finished. Hallelujah. And uh, let's conclude from these verses from Hebrews, which says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come. This is us. This is New Testament. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Let's not become distracted from coming to God and God's church. Yes, we get, we get attacked. There is a battle. But just to summarise, we value what God values and say no to going down to the oh no places. <laughs> Let's remember to pray for strength. Let's take in and digest and live by the word of God, the Bible. And finally, let's respond to Jesus. Respond by coming to Jesus, whose work on the cross is finished. He shed his blood for you. If you'd been the only person in the world, he would have died for you. But actually, his sacrifice was so great, and because he is the Son of God, he died for the whole world. We can trust him. He is our wall. He is our strong tower. The, the psalmist says, describes Jesus as our strong tower. He is our completed work of salvation. And we can live as part of the city of God, the church, knowing he's with us and for us and strong for us. 
And although the enemy tries to attack, the enemy is defeated, actually. He's a defeated enemy. He's just thrashing around trying to get us. And he does thrash. <laughs> and it's pretty nasty, his thrashing sometimes. But he is defeated. He is defeated. Hallelujah. Let's pray, shall we? And then we'll come back to worship. And we've got a very suitable song, which I've just written, which I've just seen there. You've already won, it says. <laughs> the name of the song. So there we are. Hallelujah. Let me pray.